Good day, everyone. My name is Gaia Manikin, founder of Gaia Nova Entertainment. Welcome all to this discussion on closing the gap on gender equality and women's leadership. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the founder of Harassus, Dr. Frank Jurgen Richter, for this prestigious opportunity, and Mariam Azarm, co-founder of Altru Institute, for always reminding me the art and spirit of elegance is a driving force for any movement. I'm here with five incredibly fierce and fabulous women. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us today. You are an inspiration to me. I'm thrilled to introduce Hafsa Tabiola, president of Women in Africa, Christine Heenan, founder and president of Clarendon Communications, Michelle Nunn, CEO and president of CARE, Blessing Omaku, deputy director of goalkeepers at Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and last but not least, one of the top women whom I admire and lucky to have on my board, our moderator, Pat Mitchell, founder and partner of Connected Women Leaders. What can one say about Pat in this short time? During her illustrious career of numerous achievements and honors, Pat was the first woman president and CEO at PBS, co-founder, curator, and host of TED Women, Emmy-winning producer, and she wrote the book, Becoming a Dangerous Woman, Embracing Risk to, um, to Change the World. And that is exactly what these incredible ladies have done, embracing risk to change the world, today and tomorrow for future women leaders. When I asked Pat what cause she would like to highlight in the new movement, Global Appreciation and Altruism, she said, Gaia, in order to address all the global issues, we must balance gender equality. On that note, Pat, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Gaia, and what a privilege it is for all of us to be a part of this global forum and to have this opportunity to talk to this community of leaders from civil society, government, all sectors of work and life. Thank you for this opportunity. As a former media executive, I thought I would add a headline to today's topic of gender equality. Gender equality doesn't exist truly or fully in any country in the world. And if we continue on the current path toward eliminating the barriers and continuing our progress toward gender equality, we won't reach it until 2050. That's far too late. We're also experiencing in today's world, among all the many emergencies that are requiring our priority and our attention, a pushback on many of the gains that have been made over the last six years. This is our challenge. This group of women are a part of the Rockefeller Foundation's initiative to strengthen all of the 17 United Nations Sustainability Development Goals, but our group in particular is focused on goal number five, which calls for the realization, the actualization of full gender equality everywhere in the world. That is our work, our work. We are privileged to share it with you today. And at the end, we hope to bring you in to a plan, a challenge, a championship that we hope you will feel engaged to play your part in achieving full gender equality. So let me start with this wonderful group of women leaders who come from different parts of this work and who have brought special and unique perspectives to how we assess the barriers that remain to gender equality and how we go about eliminating them and creating equal access and opportunity. Michelle Nunn is the manager, director, leader of our Goal 5 room and group and is also the president of CARE USA. Michelle, in your work and in CARE's work all over the world, you are no doubt witnessing what feels like a pushback, which is most certainly a disproportionate negative impact of the current global pandemic. And recently you produced a report about the state of women in the world. What do we learn in that report that uh, informs our goal of gender equality? 
Yeah, well, thanks, Pat. And it's wonderful to be with this extraordinary group of women uh, and my co-conspirator, Blessing, who um, we had the privilege of working together to to really um, pose this challenge to ourselves and to the world around what uh, what is the impact of COVID? How are we seeing the disproportionate um, impact play out in the lives of women around the world? And Kara has done a number of reports. We uh, we really rang the bell when the in March, more than six months months ago and said uh, that this is, as all emergencies and disasters do, going to hit those who are already most marginalized the hardest. And that is what we've seen. And so if you uh, if you think about, for instance, a report that CARE just came out with where we uh, captured the voices of 6,000 women from around the world, here's what they told us. Um, they said that they are worried about their economic livelihoods, their jobs. Um, in fact, they are 55 at 55 percent rate versus 34% rate in terms of uh, loss of jobs versus men just in this in this group that we interviewed. Um, they are also really worried about hunger and food security for their families. They are the ones that are responsible for uh, providing meals on a daily basis, and um, they are disproportionately impacted. They're the ones that are eating last and less. Um, and their, their concerns, their mental health is at stake. Um, they are taking on a disproportionate burden of care. As we know, that's happening everywhere around the world in whatever uh, country we live in. So um, they are absorbing the stresses and everything from gender-based violence to having access to family planning. So um, those are some of the impacts that we're seeing. And, and I think part of what we know needs to happen is to ensure that women are around the table as we're trying to address the these challenges. And we need more women in leadership. We know that by looking at reports from over 30 plus countries, that women in the task forces that are addressing COVID are, are smaller than they should be, right? At more like a 12 to 20 percent rate uh, versus men who are um, who are making the decisions that are affecting the lives of women. So we need more women at the table. We need more data about what's happening with women. And we need to ensure that we are bringing down the barriers that are keeping women from the equality and and the realization of their rights and their health at this critical juncture. And one thing we know that whatever emergency you happen to be addressing, whether it's climate food and security, access to education, training, global health, and um, the economic impact of this pandemic. We know that women are essential. Women leaders in particular are essential uh, in playing a role to get, to get us to adjust sustainable and equitable recovery, which is the goal for all of us uh, in this forum today. And blessing Amaku, who also co-led Room 5 and Goal 5's group, as we focused on gender equality, has recently moved to the Gates, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, in the goalkeepers' work. And the goalkeepers just did a report, blessing, which the New York Times described as grim as it looked around the world and saw many of the obstacles and barriers that Michelle referred to and others. How are you assessing that reports work and what the philanthropic sector will do about it. Thank you so much. And I echo the previous comment about just the honor of joining all of you today on this panel. I'm actually wearing my pin that says I love dangerous women. And I consider all of you to be dangerous women who are doing fierce work. But speaking about the report, it echoes a lot of what Michelle just shared about from the CARE report. We see that extreme poverty has gone up by 7% in just a few months because of COVID-19, ending a 20-year streak of progress. And of course, the newly impoverished people are more likely to be women. We're also seeing that this impacts people differently. For example, in America, women of color are more, are more likely to be disproportionately affected. We're seeing that women have increased unpaid care responsibilities, cooking, cleaning, caring for children and sick relatives. Um, and when you think about what this means for an economy, in Africa, for example, we're seeing that there have been a, a huge drop in what formal workers make. Women make up a large proportion of informal workers in the African continent. And so, yeah, the New York Times and a lot of the data it is very grim. But I'm also seeing hope. The tagline of goalkeepers has always been that progress is possible, but not inevitable. And the report lays out about three things that need to happen. Um, we need to innovate with equity. 
we need to see government, business, philanthropy come together when we think about what is an equitable lens towards creating a vaccine and distributing this vaccine. And so if, if anyone is interested in the report, if you go to gatesfoundation.org slash goalkeepers, it lays out that beautifully, but the key message is really the power of collaboration, which I'm excited to discuss more with this panel today. And I do want to come back and talk about the very big bet that at the Gates Foundation through Melinda Gates in particular has made for gender equality and how that is playing out as the partnership is built between philanthropy and government uh, as well as private sector. And when I think about private mm -hmm. sector, I can think of few people who have a, a better perspective on the way in which companies uh, as well as governments and philanthropists are viewing the barriers that exist to gender equality. And may I just stop a moment and welcome Hafset Avioli to our panel. Hafset, it's wonderful to see you and, I, and I'll be there for a question in just a, a moment or two. Christine Hennan, um, who founded and leads the Clarendon Communication Group. Um, really this whole idea of bringing in leaders from philanthropy, business, civil society, education, economy, putting us all together uh, when she was at the Rockefeller Foundation really came from uh, an initiative that, that Christine began there. And so it's been a great honor for us to have you in the gender equality group, Christine, because the perspective you bring from your work with the leaders of companies, institutions, must give you a, a very different and yet very critical lens on where we are in gender equality. Can you share that with us? I, I can, Pat, thank you. And let me just echo Blessing's comments about uh, any day that begins with this array of faces is one that gives you hope for the future, a future led increasingly by women. And so um, I'm very pleased to be here. I think on the on the private sector and corporate side, um, there, there is good news and there is bad news. The bad news as far as trends with regard to women's leadership and women's equality is that um, as both Blessing and Michelle have spoken about, just as COVID-19 has disproportionately impacted women in the developing world and poor women, it has also disproportionately impacted professional women and women on paths to leadership, in part because they are far more likely to be balancing the unpaid work that Blessing spoke about, teaching children at home, managing uh, households that have returned family members or vulnerable parents, burden the burdens of caregiving alongside trying to bill a certain number of hours as you seek to make partner at a law firm, trying to get FaceTime with, with uh, the president of the company as you seek the VP slot. All of that has been harder. I think the good news is there is a growing body of data that suggests that from the corporate sector through every other sector, when more women lead, outcomes are better. I want to call your attention to a McKinsey report issued just last week called mm -hmm. Delivering Through Diversity. The report was the second McKinsey report that looked at the top 25 companies with gender representation and senior leadership and how they performed relative to their sectors. The previous report showed a 15% increase in profitability for companies that had a higher representation of women in leadership this report re released last week shows that boost to 21%. And that really does speak to the language of the corporate sector, which is, yes, but is it a nice to do or does it affect the bottom line? I think we'll move the dial faster in the corporate sector if gender equality at the leadership level in boards, boardrooms is seen as a strategic imperative and a drive toward profitability and not simply a form of um, of social impact service or, and that's true of all diversity, by the way. The McKinsey report also looked at broader diversity indicators and the picture only improves for profitability. So it's my hope that many boardrooms are digesting that report this week and saying, how do we do more? How do we do better? And then finally on the data front, as it speaks to COVID-19, when we think about um, women's leadership of countries and in the public sector, there's undeniable evidence that COVID's impacts were, were lesser and shorter when women were in charge. And many of the leadership instincts of women, consensus building, being driven by data, being willing to mid-course correct, all of that has come to bear in ways that have literally saved lives around the world. So I think as the evidence grows in everything from private sector leadership and profitability to public sector leadership and 
um, public outcomes, the drumbeat should follow. As the evidence accumulates, Christine, and thank you very much for bringing forward that new McKinsey report. And there has actually been data over the years, right? Research that has said over and over and over again that doing good can mean doing well, uh, that the outcomes are positive when there is a more diverse and inclusive management and in boardrooms and especially in leadership. And when I think about the examples and the models for uh, overcoming barriers, for resilience uh, uh, in crisis, for strong leadership. I think about women in Africa um, from whom I have learned so much about leadership. And one of them leads a group called Women in Africa. Uh, Please welcome Hafset. And Hafset, I I say that with great uh, sincerity and privilege to have worked with women on the front lines of crisis and uh, enormous barriers uh, throughout the continent and seeing uh, this ability to keep stepping forward and keep innovating and, and presenting the right ideas. And what, what, how do you assess where women are now, knowing that this pandemic has had huge negative impact, particularly economically on women and women leaders? on the continent of Africa? I think, well, first of all, let me just say my apologies for coming late. When I um, did my prep with Gaia, she said, you can have as a background something very beautiful from Africa that shows your work. So I went to pick up um, so I went to pick up this painting and then I got, I got stuck trying to get it, get it here. And then it was delayed, but I'm going to just put it here so that you guys see something. <laughs> Something wonderful from Africa. And I just, <laughs> thank you so much, Ned. I just adore this. It was in my office and I had to rush to get it. But I want to say that it's such a pleasure to be on this panel with all of you beautiful people fighting the good fight for, you know, when I think of where women are in Africa, but not just in Africa, anywhere in the world, I actually am full of hope, not just hope. I just think actually that we will blink and we will be in the future we want, Mm. in a future where we are fully at parity. And it's so clear to me because when you see the power of women all over the world, but when you see the power of women in Africa, it's just unbelievable. You know, so because of this whole COVID crisis, right, the power of women is coming to the fore. People are noticing 70% of the caregivers in in the in as nurses as doctors as in the front lines women you know in the informal economy of africa these are the that's the you know the formal economy is where a lot of the wealth in africa is you know so you're looking at the oil companies the diamond companies you know all the big players but the informal economy powers africa because it gives the jobs Many 60, 70 percent of the jobs that people have in Africa is the informal economy. Who is dominant in the African informal economy? It's the women. And, and, and you know, because our governments are, are awake to the fact that the world's global economy is in flux and that we have to take care of our economy, they're now waking up to the fact that they have to take care of women. So, you know, we have Rwanda, which is everybody talks about Rwanda, where their House of um, Assembly, the National House of Assembly has about 64 percent women, the highest rate in the world. Then you have countries like my country. I mean, you have others. You have South Africa, you have Botswana, you have Lesotho that have 30 percent women in um, in the National Assembly. You have countries like Ethiopia that have 50 percent of women in the cabinet. Do you have countries like Nigeria? I mean, it's so embarrassing. Blessing and I are from the same place. And if you see the power of Nigerian women, you cannot, you just have to experience their power to just, those women are powerful. Mm-hmm. Most definitely. Kept out of the political arena. We're less than 6% in the political, um, in the political space. Mm-hmm. But the government that is so dominant with men, I wake to the fact that there is no economy without women. So they're really trying. They've earmarked about 60% of the coronavirus spending, which is a lot of money for us in Nigeria. It's about, I think it's about 2 trillion or so. Naira, that's our own currency. So it will be billions of dollars, which will be very small 
for a country of 200 million, but for us in African countries, these are very significant commitments that we're making. They've earmarked that to be allocated through women, through women-owned com women companies. They want to also um, direct social investment to women because they know about the unpaid care work. So they are awakening to the fact that just because the women are not physically in the decision-making tables should not lead to penalization because that only penalizes the whole economy. Mm -hmm. but, so, and then the, the most important thing I want to um, say to you, Pat, and to all my sisters in the panel, you know, in Africa, we say, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, you go together. And I see that spirit across the continent. Across the continent now, you know, even like, for example, in Nigeria, I'm part of a committee working to develop a national plan for the country till 2050. It's called Agenda 2050. And uh, the head of the committee and the deputy head, they were listening to our report of my committee on what we plan to do. And we said, oh, for the corporate sector, we want to make sure that we get to 40 percent minimum of women at management levels, at board levels. Do you know what they said to me? They said, have said, if we must focus, this is what they said, have said, if we must focus, we must focus on the poorest women. Set that aside. That's not the priority. These women are the ones that will be impacted because these are Nigeria's most educated. They're the ones that will be impacted by the quota. And they're not saying it's not important, but they're saying that if the country must make a decision, we focus on the poorest, the weakest, the most vulnerable, because we want to go together or we're not going. And I think that that solidarity is what's going to be the, it's going to um, make, it's going to break that glass ceiling because the glass ceiling is, is, um, is held up by the division of women. When women come together, there's no stopping our progress. Uh, hear, hear. <laughs> I think we will all applaud uh, that sentiment because it is so key to our progress doing this together. And we're going to come back. To that theme so yeah. uh, with, with an important announcement about how we might do that even better have said and i want to hear later too how you have witnessed um this going together and the progress it's made i want to pick up on something though that you said that's been mentioned and and blessing i'm going to come to you with this because when melinda gates announced her one billion dollar uh, investment in gender equality. A lot of people said, why now? This is the worst time to put gender equality because there's so many other priorities. We've got a climate emergency, food insecurity, more people in poverty, and, and, and in particular, the adverse first impact on, on women is pushing us back and it pushed gender equality, tried to push it anyway, off the priority list. And exactly at that time, the Gates Foundation said, no, this is when we must invest more, do more. How are you seeing that play out? How, what is our role in keeping gender equality foremost in the minds of those making the decisions? Great question. I mean, what we've seen from the data is that if you do not invest in SDG 5 and gender equality, you will not achieve any of the other goals. Women are at the heart and soul of every single goal. And what we've learned from previous investments is that when you do not factor women in, in the investments that you're making in the design, that you actually lose not just on the goals, but also on the investment. For example, if you go to a rural area to build public toilets and you don't factor in women and their security needs and, and you know, probably factors around rape and being spied on and all of that, they will not use those toilets that you've built. And so that's a waste of investment. And so I think that across every single SDG, factoring women is key and important. And so at the foundation, gender now is not just part of the agenda, it is the agenda. There's a new gender division, um, a gender president has been appointed. And I, I think, Christine, you were also on the Gender Equality Special Initiative, where we thought about what are barriers that exist right now in unique ways, who are actors that we need to bring in that haven't been brought into the conversation. I, for example, led some research around women of faith and how we need to incorporate women like that. So it's a really comprehensive study around what are barriers that exist, who are the key constituents, how do we bring everybody in? But speaking about Melinda on a personal level and, and maybe shifting the focus, I think it's so easy for us to discuss what organizations should do and what government should do and forget what our roles are as, as people. And I think about Melinda the first time I met her, 
a big bet she made was on me, which is we have this goalkeepers initiative um, and they curate sessions every year. And Melinda Gates can have anyone in the world, as we all know, host her session and curate her session. But she said, I like what you have to say. Why don't you do it? That was a big bet. And then she stepped down from leading her session and had women of color do her entire session. And for me, that speaks to the power that all of us have as individuals. Think about what privilege do we have? What spaces do we occupy? How do we bring in voices that may not be known? Um, how do we elevate people that may not be known? How do we elevate voices um, that need to really have a voice or, or need to have space to, to speak about important issues? And so I think about her as taking a big bet, not just on gender, but in her personal work with individuals. And it's a lesson that I'm trying to carry on into my work as well. Your stated admiration for Melinda is shared by everyone on this call, and in particular, her her current not only investment, but the way in which she's become such a spokesperson for um, the fact that we cannot have the just, sustainable world we all desire if we don't have women in all decision-making places, in forums like this and in every room where decisions are made. And Michelle, you have been that person, that woman in the room, often you have worked with women leaders on the ground, proximate leaders who are dealing with these threats and challenges every day. And we know women are essential to this recovery, to building back better. Um, where do you see CARE's role, um, the role of philanthropic service organizations, as well as, as the other partnerships that are essential to bring this about? Yeah, well, I, I think it is um, so powerful to think about the collective power that we have and if we can truly embrace that together. And that means by as individuals, as organizations and as sectors. And I think, you know, CARE is a 75 um, year old organization that has a lot of platform for engagement with governments. Uh, with corporations, and we see that as as a, a real a, ourselves as a bridge um, in many ways. And so, if you think about um, CARES work. We are uh, working to lift up women's voices. So, in places like Malawi, that means uh, working with local women's organizations and having press conferences to talk about women's rights. And uh, it means mentoring uh, women that are already in government in Malawi. Uh, and and really, again, through a combination of partnership modalities, um, ensuring that women are at the table. Um, it also means uh, working with the private sector and thinking about women and capital. Um, Hofset talked about the incredible power of women as entrepreneurs, and so much of that is in the informal market, but there are huge barriers to women equal access uh, to, um, to capital in all sorts of forms. I mean, we work with smallholder women farmers who do, uh, you know, half of the work in the world, but have significantly less access as smallholder farmers uh, to markets, to seeds, to training. And if they had equal access, we would be able to feed 150 million more people in the world. So again, access to capital, access to markets, that's a big part of what CARE is helping to do. And then I think we're also trying to lift up what are the specific interventions that uh, that government and that communities need to be thinking of and aware aware of. Uh, we know that gender-based violence is escalating in significant measure. So how are we responding to that? How are we ensuring, for instance, that, um, that women continue to have access to uh, to family planning uh, at a time when uh, so many health infrastructures are overburdened. Um, so women don't have basic access to, uh, you know, to family planning or to uh, to the capacity for um, maternal, uh, you know, access for giving birth. And so these are some of the things that I think CARE is doing around voice, around capital, and also around specific interventions and all done in partnership with local organizations. And I think we also have to call out with local women's movements who are at the center of this work and that we all need to find ways of lifting up and supporting if we really want to have transformational change. Transformational change too will come from partnerships. I mean, we know that we've seen it in history over and over again and have sets proverb uh, reminds us if we want to go far and have sustainable development, uh, everywhere and equally, uh, it will take us working together. That means the private sector, Christine. Mm -hmm. How do they come into this? Um, are there companies? Are there models? You, you shared some really critical data about what we know when women are in those leadership positions in companies. What are you seeing that gives you hope 
that the partnership with the private sector will strengthen and be a part of this resolution towards gender equality. I think what makes me most optimistic, and some of this comes from research done as part of the Gender Equality Special Initiative at Gates, is that there are more pathways and more defined pathways than ever before for the private sector to move the dial on increasing opportunity and increasing leadership opportunity inside the private sector. Let me walk you through just a couple. One, um, the understanding of the importance of building gender equality in from the beginning. There's increasing evidence that if you look at founding teams of the company, those founding teams are where leadership comes from and the majority of wealth creation comes from. If you are conscious of building diversity, gender diversity into founding teams, you're going to create more leaders and more wealth in the hands of women. And you asked for examples. One example I love is the um, New York Stock Exchange run for the first time by a woman has an initiative inside the stock exchange in which as they prepare to bring companies forward as IPOs, they work with those companies about board representation prior to IPO and reach from the boards of other member companies from the exchange to say, Pat Mitchell might be a great person on your board. Hafsat might be a great person given what your company does and where its reach is. That's a great example. Secondly, there are companies that are doing a very good job of completely removing the argument of we're just not having women apply or there aren't as many women in our sector. There's an organization called Power to Fly that uses really great, sophisticated AI matching and goes to the Microsofts and to the other companies in finance, in tech, where women are grossly underrepresented and said, we'll gather the women for you. We've got the databases. We've got let's you've got the jobs. We've got the women applicants. Let's marry up. The third is, you know, part of what gender equality has suffered from in the workplace is a lack of quantification and clarification of what good looks like. What does an equal workplace look like? And if you compare that, for example, to building an environmentally sustainable building, we have a global taxonomy called LEED. This is a LEED gold building. This is a LEED certified building. Organizations like EDGE are bringing that to bear for gender, saying if you are an EDGE certified company, that means you have certain workplace practices around safety, you have certain representation, you have pay equality or you're working toward it. So I would love to see that 10 years from now, when smart young women are coming out of colleges, business schools, training programs, they say, hmm, I'm looking at two jobs, this company is EDGE certified. So I'm more likely to want to work at that company and to advance in that company. And the minute that is meaningful in the marketplace, more companies will pay attention and seek that kind of certification. And then finally, I think we have levers through policy and law to influence private sector practice. If you look at the law that was put in place in California, California 826, around mandatory representation on boards, there were lawsuits, there were fights. Oh, this is going to mess up how corporate governance works. It's been a great experience in California, such that just yesterday, Governor Newsom signed a similar legislation around racial diversity in California. So in this case, gender paved a way to say diversity is not scary. Diversity is a strength for corporations. We need to take this on. It will strengthen companies. So I think there's a lot that's happening. Um, We have companies, organizations like Time's Up that are increasing attention to workplace safety and the eradication of harassment in the workplace, which has driven many women out of seeking leadership positions or out of whole fields. There's a remarkable and upsetting field called Picture a Scientist that looks at what women in science suffer and women who wanted to be astronauts until they were the you know graduate research assistant of an abusive male scientist and said, this isn't worth it for me. The more we are bringing these various pathways to light in the private sector, the more we're gonna see women break through barriers and take those positions. I think mentorship in the private sector is also key, but I know we're going to talk more about that in a minute. So I'll hold my comments for that. I'm feeling more hope at this (laughs) moment. (laughs) And I think I'm seeing that reflected in the faces of of all of us. And I hope in the faces of those listening, because this is, this is real. This is happening. This is real evidence 
of what difference, positive differences, gender equity makes. And I just want to add one thing to all those great initiatives that you share with us, Christine, that the narrative has to change too, that women have to be represented and not misrepresented in narrative. And uh, the Sundance Institute also has a initiative which qualifies uh, movies on the same way that Edge qualifies companies. It's mm-hmm. called Reframe. Um, and so again, we're, we're trying to reframe the story about gender equity and gender equality and, and all the differences that, that it will make. And one of the ways we can do that is mentorship. And it goes back to what I've set, said earlier. Um, we can go a lot further if we are doing this together and strengthening all of us. Uh, from corporate leaders to government leaders to each and every individual with us today. I'll start with you, have said on mentoring, because Women in Africa started a program some time ago, which recognized that the way forward to real gender equity was to bring each other along. How has that program worked? It's brilliant. We get a lot of the technical partner um, that, provides that um, mentoring program for us is Deloitte and Touche, and it's their Paris office. So um, we do a call across the continent. The last, the very first, the pilot um, t- um, phase, which was last year, we brought together 30 women from 30 countries in Africa. Some of them had problems getting the visa to France then, and you can imagine what that would be like now in this era of COVID. But then they, some of them had problems, but the, the design was that um, they would come together to Paris and they'll do a kind of retreat. And um, we, would, um, we would provide for them the rules of mentoring, um, what the mentor is expected, um, what is expected of the mentor, what is expected of the mentee. And really the rules are, I think, largely common sense. So there's some, you have to listen, you have to engage, and you have to do it in a structured way. So the, you have to um, have structured conversations every month and check in with each other. And I was, I attended their graduation of, um, from the program in June. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. We even had some people who were Francophone and some Anglophone. And so there were, you know, there should have been a language problem, but they, it, it didn't seem that there was in the end. The women were able to really gain a lot from each other. Both the mentor learned a lot from the mentee and the mentee from the mentor. So it's really um, pushed the women further in their businesses. They all said that they had a clearer idea how to manage in their business, how to mm. uh, overcome obstacles, how to put together a business plan because the um, the mentor was able to guide the mentee through the process. So it's really um, a game changer for us because the key, you know, in Africa, Africa actually leads the world in the um, proportion of women that start their businesses. But we also lead the world in the proportion of women whose businesses fail. And I think, you know, there's a lot that has to do with the um, obstacles in the um, prevailing environment, like um, government policies. But a lot of it also has to do with skills and competencies. We often start the business sometimes driven by necessity, not by opportunity. And we often don't have the skills to manage and run the business successfully. So it's it's really a cost to the continent that we have to bridge. So I challenged our friends at Deloitte to come up with a way that we could then reach 200 in a year. And they're working on that now because we first did 20, um, 30. Now, I have to tell you that my real goal is that at a point we have to be reaching 200,000 in a year and even 200,000 for a continent with 1.3 billion people yeah. and 650 million women. You can imagine that even 200,000 is so modest, but I don't want to just hit them with the big numbers. You know, I want to be very gentle and, you know, supportive, well, be gradual. Yeah. So it, it go, it's going very well. And now they're working towards the 200 number and next year we'll hit them with maybe 2,000. Fantastic. But it, the, what you're saying is the power of mentoring to make transformative change in individual lives and companies. And that's our, that's our plan. That's our challenge. That's our, uh, that we're announcing today that we've decided that 
there is a way forward. There is a way that each and every one of us has a role to play. And because we're working on sustainability goal number five, we're calling it five for five. And Michelle, uh, you and Blessing and all of us were a part of thinking, what can each of us individually do that moves this goal forward? Tell us more about how five for five is going to work. Yeah, well, I think it is in that spirit of we all have um, big organizational and institutional and uh, other goals, but we all also have our own personal efficacy and capacity for platforms for leadership and engagement. And uh, I think one of the things we've recognized is the essential truth that Hafsat said, which is when women come together, there's no stopping us. Mm-hmm. And, um Ultimately, we believe that uh, we need more women coming together and we need more women coming together from the continent of Africa with the continent of, of South and North America. And we need more women coming across uh, generations and working together. So um, if you think about the sustainable development goal, which is the fifth goal, but which we think is the foundational goal for all of the other goals, uh, then this challenge of five for five means we're challenging women from around the world uh, to take up the challenging of mentoring, uh, mentoring one another. And that means um, that we would like that uh, everyone who's listening here, and we hope we'll spread it out um, around our platforms, uh, will say, I'm going to reach out to somebody and I'm going to either offer mentorship or I'm going to ask for mentorship. Um, and we also recognize that mentorship is actually circular um, and it's not linear. It actually is. It goes both ways. And that's one of the essential elements that we think is a part of this. And so Blessing and I, I feel like have had a mentoring relationship, but it is definitely, if anything, um, despite our ages, it's coming from, you know, from her to me. Uh, much more so than me to her. And so that's a part of this. So taking five hours over the course of a year and committing to working together, learning from one another, maybe working on a project together, or maybe just sharing ideas with one another. And then to take that and to say, I challenge five other women to do the same. And so let me turn it over to my uh, to my um, colleagues and friends here uh, to talk a little bit more about how it might work. Could I just jump in there because I, I, I will um, sign up right now for this pledge. And I want to talk about how I could imagine that working for me on either side. First of all, if I didn't have a female boss in the White House when I was 24 years old, who managed a uh, both a child in school and an older child with special needs, and to see her say, everyone come over to the West Wing, we're having a birthday party for him, or we're doing the following thing, and to see her manage deep commitment to her family, along with being the head of the Domestic Policy Council for the entire country, I wouldn't have known that obstacle course myself and to see it done. And I benefited so much in my own career from mentorship that as I listen to Hafsat and her example, I want to say, Hafsat, as, as you know of women who create businesses in Africa, in consulting, in communications, I want to spend some of my five hours helping them succeed and not fail. How do you price work? How do you think about keeping a client? I know that there's things I can bring to women elsewhere who are seeking a path. How do I negotiate for a raise? How do I think about? And women have a unique superpower. They can invent time in the calendar. They have to, right? Because and so I know every, every woman I know, every successful woman I know in particular, knows how to create five hours in their year, let alone in their day. And, you know, so I, I want to be the first to sign up for the pledge and say how valuable it is. One of the things I was thinking about when Hafsa joined us was for so many professional women who get to the top, they navigate an obstacle course like you navigated today. I'm going to reach that challenge of going to get this beautiful painting and having it behind me, this photograph. <laughs> and I'm going to get in the Uber and then get out of the corner and then and then slide into my seat and be ready. And that is the life of a woman leader. And so helping other women understand how to navigate those obstacle courses, I can't imagine a better use of five hours. So sign me up. You heard it first here. We can create time, but not here. (laughs) We have a limited limited amount of time. Uh, So very quickly, blessing, your call to action around this this mentorship championship or challenge. 
I think I'll go with the line, each one reach one. If every single person just commits to even just one person, that five hours could be with one person. Or if you have five people you can reach, you can do five people. But just one person, it makes a huge difference. I know that my life, I've benefited from mentoring. And my commitment now to think about who is the generation behind me, Generation Z. How do I empower them? How do I give my time? So each one reach one is where I'll leave it at. Love it. Michelle, do you have a final call to action or pledge or any any way you want to challenge those listening to us? Well, I just I would say I sign me up as well. I, I, I <laughs> pledge my commitment and um, and I know that I will learn uh, a lot more than I um, will be able to give. And uh, and so I would just encourage people to actually go to we actually have a uh, website five for five challenge dot org and, um, and and show that you uh, want to raise your hand for the five for five challenge. I uh, we could just keep going on with this, but let me just say very quickly because I feel the excitement that everyone says five for five. I can do that across geographies, across generations. This is the way we go further together. So if you want more information, go to 545, that's the number, 4, 5 at care.org, or go to 545challenge at wordpress.com. We're just starting this. You're getting the first announcement, by the way, that we are going to do this because we know that woman to woman, we can and do change the world. Thank you for joining us today. Now back to the Harassus Global Forum. Bye all.